intracranial pressure is really the pressure of the cerebrospinal fluid. So your brain is surrounded by a fluid which is called the cerebrospinal fluid. And the hydrostatic pressure of that fluid is what is known as intracranial pressure. That pressure is very important because it is a pressure that um, exerts, well, that pressure is very important because it can be elevated in certain disease conditions. So a traumatic injury to the brain, for example, can lead to an increase in intracranial pressure. A, a hemorrhagic stroke can lead to an increase in intracranial pressure. So intracranial pressure is an important marker of a disease of the brain. It is very important to measure in a whole variety of pathologies, such as traumatic brain injury, hydrocephalus, um, and, and hemorrhagic stroke. And it becomes a cardinal vital sign, if you wish, of um, a neurovascular state. The way that intracranial pressure is currently being monitored is that a neurosurgeon will drill a hole into your skull and advance a catheter um, through your brain tissue into one of the ventricular spaces, which are essentially at the center of your brain or close to the center of your brain, and then measure the fluid pressure that exists in that space. Drilling a hole into the skull obviously is an incredibly invasive procedure and would only be done in patients who are very, very sick. Although the measurement of intracranial pressure might actually benefit a much larger patient pool than just those with, for example, severe traumatic brain injury or um, hemorrhagic stroke or brain tumor. There is a, about a 40-year history of research in the domain of non-invasive intracranial pressure monitoring. Can we actually measure or estimate intracranial pressure non-invasively from measurements that we can actually easily make without having to penetrate the skull? Our own work in this area um, was motivated uh, a few years ago by attending a workshop where mathematicians and physiologists and clinicians came together to talk about frontier research in the domain of um, the cerebrospinal fluid space. And uh, what we subsequently developed is a method to estimate intracranial pressure non-invasively on the basis of measuring cerebral blood flow velocity and arterial blood pressure, both of which can be measured either non-invasively or with relatively uh, less invasively than drilling a hole into someone's skull. And what we actually use these input data for is to identify the parameters of a small mathematical model of the cerebrospinal fluid space. And the, the parameters of, these, of this model are important parameters in which the neurologist or the neurosurgeon actually uh, thinks in terms of. One is intracranial pressure. Another one is a cerebrovascular resistance or the resistance to blood flow through the, through the brain. And the third one is a lumped compliance or a lumped representation of the elastic properties of the arteries and the veins. So um, we have developed this small uh, mathematical model. And from the data of cerebral blood flow velocity and arterial blood pressure waveforms, we actually estimate these three parameters in real time uh, from patients um, who have these kinds of measurements. These are usually patients in neurocritical care. And we produce estimates of intracranial pressure, resistance, and compliance. There are other approaches that people have put forward. Um, and um, this is a very active research field currently in, uh, in neurocritical care monitoring, um, partly because intracranial pressure is such a important variable to monitor that multiple groups are you know, trying to uh, estimate intracranial pressure non-invasively. But the benefit would be tremendous. Currently, intracranial pressure monitoring is limited to, to patients who are very, very sick. Patients in whom the invasiveness of the procedure is outweighed by the need to know the variable. But you could imagine that a much broader patient pool could actually benefit from the measurement. And 
the measurement, a non-invasive measurement, would actually enable a great host of things. You could actually um, take the measurement at the first point of patient contact. For a soldier, this could be in a battlefield. For a football player, this could be at the football field. For an ice hockey player, it could be in the ice rink if someone actually has a major um, injury to the head. It could allow in time an evidence-based um, application of therapy. By knowing the actual number of intracranial pressure, you could start administering therapy at the ambulance, in the, you know, at the ambulance, for example, or you know, at the site of injury. Um, and you wouldn't have to wait for a neurosurgeon to be available to actually place the um, invasive catheter and, um, and make the measurement available to you. It would allow long-term monitoring without the risk of infection or um, risk to um, vital brain structures that um, are currently inherent to the measurement of um, the direct measurement of intracranial pressure. And therefore, it could actually expand the patient pool significantly. We don't know, because of the invasiveness of the current procedure, we don't know um, what intracranial pressure does in headaches, migraines, for example. We don't know whether intracranial pressure is elevated in patients with mild and moderate traumatic brain injury. So these are all patient pools that could benefit from, um, from having a non-invasive uh, measurement of intracranial pressure. As, for example, hydrocephalus patients. Patients with hydrocephalus have elevated volumes of cerebrospinal fluid. And um, often the therapy, um, it is not quite and often it is not quite clear whether the therapy is actually working. And so by measuring intracranial pressure and being able to measure intracranial pressure non-invasively, um, we could actually help a great number of patients. There are some very promising technologies currently um, coming out in, uh, for measuring or estimating intracranial pressure non-invasively. Uh, most of these technologies are currently in the state of clinical validation clinical validation against the gold standard, which is the ventricular measurement. So I think right now this field is in a phase of, um, of clinical validation where we actually have to figure out what, is, what are the limitations of, in terms of accuracy and in terms of the precision, precision of these measurements. And we're in the process of trying to convince our clinical colleagues that it can actually be done, that we can actually get at intracranial pressure non-invasively with the kind of accuracy and with the kind of precision that is needed in order to make clinical decisions. The next steps for many of these technologies is uh, simply prospective clinical validation, prospective clinical trials, that we can actually establish the performance boundaries of these methods, hopefully being able to convince our clinical colleagues that the performance are, is good enough so that in certain cases the invasive measurement can actually be replaced by a non-invasive measurement. But that evidence has yet to be established and is currently being addressed you know, through validation um, studies and through prospective clinical trials. There are currently a number of promising technologies um, under investigation that indicate to us that we can actually get at intracranial pressure non-invasively. In order to translate from a research project that has promise to a product or a clinical tool, we have to be able to demonstrate that we can estimate intracranial pressure non-invasively with the same kinds of accuracy and precision that allows a clinicians to make clinical decisions with reasonable confidence. And the field now currently is in the stage where these number of candidate um, technologies exist, where we have to go through the step of clinical validation against the clinical gold standard, and then prospective clinical validation that we can actually demonstrate that in a number of pathologies, right, and in a heterogeneous patient population, if you wish, the performance of these, of these uh, technologies uh, is actually adequate so that neurosurgeons, neurocritical care intensivists, and neurologists would actually be willing to accept these measurements. Apart from the big benefit and the obvious benefit to patient care, of not having to drill a hole into someone's skull and advancing a catheter into someone's brain, there's also 
fundamentally new insights that I think we will derive from having a non-invasive approach to intracranial pressure monitoring. Intracranial pressure is a very important variable to monitor um, for the health of the brain. Because the current uh, measurement technology is so invasive, we actually do not know how intracranial pressure, uh, whether intracranial pressure is involved in a number of pathologies. So it will be truly an enabling technology to study the involvement of intracranial pressure elevations in a whole host of pathologies. I'm also convinced that we will actually learn a great deal about basic brain physics, the, the you know, physics of the cerebrospinal fluid space, uh, from knowing intracranial pressure in a wide variety of pathologies that are currently excluded from the measurements. So I think both at the clinical level, but also in the basic physiology and basic, basic science level, having access to this measurement and non-invasively will greatly accelerate our knowledge and will also greatly help us to actually take care of patients who have injuries to their brains.